Dr. Yvonne Kason. She is the president and co-founder of Spiritual Awakenings International. And I mean, we are emerging so rapidly. It's just phenomenal. She's also a family uh, physician and transpersonal psychotherapist, retired. And she previously had a faculty position at the University of Toronto. She is an internationally renowned medical expert on near-death experiences, a near-death, and became the first Canadian medical doctor to specialize her medical practice in the research and counseling of patients with diverse types of STEs. Dr. Kason is the person who first coined the phrase spiritually transformative experiences in 1994 in her book, A Farther Shore. She's had five near-death experiences herself, two in her childhood and three in her adult life, as well as multiple STEs. She's past president of the IONS Board of, of Directors, which is the International Association for Near-Death Studies and a former IONS board member. She is co-leader and co-founder of Toronto Awakenings Sharing Group and is a member of ASSIST the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. As a pioneer in the field of spiritual, spiritually transformative experiences for over 40 years, she is also the co-founder and longtime board member of the Kundalini Research Network. It's a real honor to have her here today and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kason. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It is my pleasure to be uh, pitch hitting. Is that what they call it? Pitch hitting today, uh, filling in for Diane. So what I'm going to be speaking to you about today is a topic dear to my heart, which is Kundalini awakenings and near death experiences. So I'm going to share a screen with you. I have some slides that I want to share during my presentation. So um, yes, I'm going to be talking today about a yogic perspective on Kundalini awakenings and near-death experiences. And this is my book, Touched by the Light, in case some of you are interested in learning more about what I have to say on this topic and many other things about STEs. Uh, just came out last fall, so uh, Touched by the Light. Now, as Robert said, I coined this phrase, spiritually transformative experiences, back in 1994 as an umbrella phrase because I noticed that different kinds of experiences were all causing a spiritual awakening in, in people who had them, and they all had very, very similar after effects. And previously, it was all sort of separated, like there'd be one group over there looking just at near-death experiences, another group over here looking just at psychic phenomenon, and yet another group over there looking at kundalini experiences. And it seemed to me that these and other, other paranormal experiences were all connected in some way. And that's why I coined this phrase, spiritually transformative experiences, as an umbrella term. And what are the main types? Just very quickly as a way of an introduction. So the way I classify them is drawing very much from the yogic model, because as I was searching as a young doctor and as a spiritual seeker to try and come to an understanding of the experiences that I was having, I'm going to share this with a bit more with you in a minute, and also the experiences my patients were having, I started searching widely in the literature, both in medical literature, psychological literature, and also spiritual literature. And I found that the best explanations I could find came in yoga, from the yogic literature. And mystical experiences in yoga are called samadhis. That's a Sanskrit word, samadhi. And there are many types of mystical experiences. If you want to know more about this details, in detail, uh, we talk about it on our website, but also uh, in my book and in the talk that I gave a few months back, I go in detail about the types of mystical experiences. The next category, spiritual energy or kundalini episodes, which I'm going to be talking about today. 
various types of psychic experiences, which in yoga are called cities. And again, there are a vast number of types of psychic experiences that people are having, automatic writing, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, channeling, mediumship, out-of-body experiences, past life recall, pre premonitions, telepathy, transdimensional experiences, including some UFO encounters. Then there are uh, inspired creativity and genius the whole group of near-death experiences and the many subtypes of near-death experiences. Then there are the other death-related STEs and specifically one, the deathbed visions or end-of-life experiences that happen to people shortly before they actually die. And that includes something called terminal lucidity. Then there are death watch experiences that happen right at the time that somebody else dies. So this is sometimes called the shared death experience and after death communications. When we have, it seems the spirit of someone who died maybe days, weeks, or months, or years earlier is trying to communicate with us. So these are the categories of STEs. Now, how did I, as a medical doctor, get interested in all of this? Well, in my adult awareness, I mean, I now realize I had two near-death experiences as a child, but I one at five and one at 11, but I didn't realize that. As a child, I had nothing to judge it against. I just thought those were experiences. But the first experience that caught my attention, and I knew it was something unusual, happened in 1976. And this was when I was in my last year of medical school. And I now realize it was a kundalini awakening. But for years, I wasn't sure what to even call this experience that happened to me. So what basically happened was, um, I was in my last year of medical school, as I explained, and at the university campus, there was a, a group there that was offering a meditation course. And they said, if you took this meditation course, that meditation would help you get better marks on your exams, that basically you'd be more relaxed when you study, you'd be more relaxed in your uh, exams, so you'd do better. And so I thought, gee, I want to do well in my final medical school exam, so I took this meditation course. And I'm saying all this so that you know, it wasn't like I was trying to have some sort of paranormal experience. I was actually trying to do better on my exams. But once I learned how to meditate, I took this meditation course, I discovered I really liked meditating. It felt like a natural fit. It felt like something I'd done for many incarnations, which I think it was. And so I started meditating regularly for about almost an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. And it did, as a matter of fact, help me do extremely well on, on my exams as it was supposed to. But about three months after I had started meditating regularly, when I was in a large group meditation and I was deep in my meditation, suddenly I felt this very strong physical sensation. I felt this rush of energy going up my body and back and then it seemed to go out through the top of my head and then I slipped out of body. I, I went, my point of perception rose up out of my body and suddenly I found myself maybe 20, my point of perception, 20 or 30 feet above my body. And I, I expanded. It was that sense of me or what I think of myself was no longer like the size of my head or the size of my body. I seemed to expand. So I seemed to fill this vast size of this large auditorium that I was in. And then in this expansive state of consciousness, I also um, transformed. I, 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 it was like, I shifted into an energy field of pure, profound love. And um, I forgot to mention that when the, I had the rush of energy going up my body and back, I also heard a loud inner roaring sound, like the roar of a waterfalls. And, and, and I remember as I was in this expanded state and feeling this incredible feeling of love, I remember thinking, ah, oh, no wonder people like to meditate. This is incredible. 
I thought in my naivety that I finally gotten my technique right. And this was like the it experience that people were, were having, that the experienced meditators were having every time that they meditated. And I was actually a little bit embarrassed that it had taken me so long to get my technique right, to have the it experience. So I didn't even tell anybody about it after it happened. And I stayed in this expanded state of love until my meditation was over. And when my meditation was over, my consciousness contracted and it came back to the size of my body. But interesting, now that I look back, I had definite after effects after this experience. I started having recurrent experiences of energy rushes in my body. Energy rushes up my spine was most frequent when I'd be meditating or concentrating on a spiritual topic. And sometimes the energy rushes would be so dramatic that my body would actually pulse, like I would move, I would sort of jerk with the energy rushes going up my spine. And sometimes they were energy rushes in my arms and my legs. And sometimes it was like I was vibrating with energy. And sometimes I could feel streams of energy. Sometimes I would feel movements of energy, particularly around what uh, I now know are chakra points. Also, I would hear inner sounds. And for years, I didn't know that this was connected. I thought, uh, at first, I thought I had a cricket infestation in my house because I kept hearing this inner sound like the sound of crickets. And then other times I was hearing deep, low rumbling sounds like there was a heavy truck going down my street and I, in the middle of the night. And I'd look out the window and I'd go, no, there's no truck out. What is this rumbling sound? And then other times and the most frequent uh, sound in, uh, now is sort of like a high pitched tinkling ringing sound, sort of like the music of the spheres. I now know that these are all inner sounds that are affiliated with Kundalini awakening and these energy sensations, soccer sensations. But back then I had no clue what was going on. Then this was sort of my introduction to unusual experiences, this Kundalini awakening in 1976. Then two and a half about years later, I had another profound experience, which was I had a near death experience in a plane crash. And this was when I was a medical resident and I was on a medevac flight. And just because of time today, I'm just gonna give a very, very short version of what happened. And so in the, co the, the course of this plane crash, um, as the plane was crashing to the ground and I, in, in just panic and terror, as I saw we were about to crash, out of my heart leapt the words, God help, I'm gonna die. And, and this wasn't out loud, it was in my head. And as soon as that plea for help, I think it was close enough to a prayer for God. Um, as soon as that plea for help came out of my heart, immediately my near-death experience started. And this was before the plane had crashed. And what happened is I felt this force field of peace descend upon me. And it's like it pushed away all of the fear. And I became filled with calm. I was totally at peace and I heard a voice in my head say, be still and know that I am God. I am with you now and always. And those words just reverberated through my soul and I felt like this mystical peace. The plane came to a, a, a sort of semi-guided crash landing on the surface of a semi-frozen lake, skidded across the ice, and then as soon as it came to a stop, the plane broke through the ice and rapidly sank. So I had to very quickly get out of the plane, and I tried to get the patient out of the plane. The nurse tried to help me, but we were unable to. She unfortunately went down with the plane when it crashed. The pilot got out the other side, and then we were in open water in the middle of winter. It was in a blizzard, in a snowstorm. That is what has caused a crash. And I had to swim along approximately 200 yards to get to the closest shore. And I had to swim this. I was wearing heavy winter clothes, a parka and boots. It's a miracle 
through the grace of God that I survived swimming that long and difficult swim. It was a very difficult swim. My clothes were dragging me down. I went under several times. My lungs would fill up with lake water and I'd have to kick and kick and kick and struggle to get my head above the water and then keep swimming. Anyway, part way to swim to shore, part way swimming to shore, my near death experience deepened. And all of a sudden, I heard that loud roaring noise again, like I'd heard in my Kundalini awakening. I heard like the roar of a waterfalls. And suddenly my point of perception was whisked up out of my body. And all of a sudden there I was above my body again, maybe 20 or 30 feet above my body and looking down. But it was more complicated because it felt like my consciousness was two places at the same time like a split screen TV where you have a big image and a little image. The little image, a little tiny bit of my consciousness was still in my body that was still struggling to swim to shore. Whereas most of my consciousness now was above my body, looking down. And then the bulk of my consciousness rose higher and it rose into a realm that was filled with light and filled with love. I mean, now we've heard about people with NDEs having these white light experiences. And back then I'd not heard about it. But for me, the most profound aspect of where I had gone to, if we can use the word gone, or what I was experiencing was not in fact the light, although it was filled with light, it was the love. It was the profound, intense, unconditional love that I was feeling. That was the most powerful part of the experience for me. And somehow I knew things when I was in this realm of love and light, not because I heard a voice speaking them, but somehow I just knew things. And I absolutely knew that this love that I was feeling was the unconditional love of our higher power or what I call God. And this was not anything at all like what I had been taught God to be like in my church of upbringing. It was not an old man sitting on a throne with his long beard in a book. Have you been good? Have you been bad? Nothing like that at all. It was more like the Eastern concept. What I was experiencing was this universal, like a universal force field of love and infinite intelligence that is underlying and penetrating, in, interpenetrating all of creation. Anyway, a whole series of coincidences, which I won't share today because of time, led to my rescue. I was brought by helicopter to a local hospital. They ended up in the hospital. I was near drowning and hypothermic, almost frozen to death when I was at, arrived at the hospital. And they resuscitated me by rewarming my body in the hot whirlpool baths by putting me in the hot water. And when I was in that hot water is when I felt my consciousness re-enter my body. And it was like this, it was whoosh. It was like, I can imagine what it would be like for Jeannie being sucked in, into the, a bottle. I was in this big expanded place up above. And then suddenly I was sucked down with a whisking noise. It seemed through the top of my head into the tiny confines of my body. And then I knew I was back and I knew I had survived. Now this experience had powerful after effects on me, powerful after effects. I mean, my spiritual focus was dramatically increased by this experience. I was like love intoxicated for about four weeks afterwards. I was like in love with the universe and love with the squirrels in my yard and love with children playing down the street. Music made me have feelings of love pour out of my heart. It was like I was love intoxicated afterwards. I had a psychic awakening a couple weeks after this happened. My first clairvoyant experience, what the first of what turned out to be many other clairvoyant experiences I've had over the course of my life. But also I noticed a marked increase in my Kundalini experiences uh, at symptoms after this near death experience. I was having much more uh, sensations of energy rushes up my spine. I was having many more experiences of energy movements. I was having many more experiences of light, much more inner sounds. So I always wondered, is there some connection between near death experiences and Kundalini awakening? Now I wanna mention that this NDE changed the course of my life. 
And like other NDEers, it made me lose my fear of death. I became absolutely certain of the reality of a higher power and that that higher power is loving in nature. And I became a real spiritual seeker. It made me launch a spiritual quest when I started learning from many spiritual traditions, trying to understand what had happened to me. And I struggled for years trying to find even a name to describe what had happened to me. I was initially told by somebody who thought they knew something about Kundalini that what had happened to me could not possibly have been a Kundalini awakening because I was too young, I was too inexperienced, I hadn't been meditating long enough, that Kundalini awakenings only happened to people who'd been meditating for 40 years under the supervision of a guru. And so I was told it's not a Kundalini awakening. Okay, if it's not a Kundalini awakening, well, what is it? And similarly, my near death experience, I had people telling me it was a hallucination. My doctor friends said it was a hallucination. I just could not believe it was a hallucination. It had such a profound, positive, spiritually transformative impact on me. I knew it was not a hallucination. And then when I went to see our local and person who thought they were the NDE expert, they told me it was not a near death experience because A, I had not seen a tunnel, which no, I had not seen a tunnel and B, because I'd not been clinically dead at any point. So I thought, okay, it's not a Kundalini awakening. It's not a near death experience. What are these things then? And what are they related in some way? So this is what compelled me as a young medical doctor. So one experience was in medical school and the other one was when I was completing my medical residency that I began to research the whole spectrum of spiritually transformative experiences. The, the best name I had found for my near death experience at that time was a mystical experience. That, so for years I called it a mystical experience that happened to me in the plane crash. And then I was also researching Kundalini and diverse psychic awakenings because I'd had the psychic awakening after my um, uh, near death experience and near death experiences. So I started privately in my private time researching all of these things while I was practicing traditional Western medicine. But during my years of privately researching, I had some things that really impacted my life. And number one is that I met Gopi Krishna. I traveled to India in 1977 with my meditation group and I first met Gopi Krishna. And I corresponded with him and met him several times until he died in 1984. And those of you who may not know, Gopi Krishna wrote prolifically about Kundalini awakening and about the yogic model of consciousness and Kundalini, because it was his belief from his own profound spontaneous Kundalini awakening that more and more people would be having Kundalini awakenings in the West and that awareness of Kundalini had to be brought out because it was going to be happening to more and more people at this current evolutionary stage of our development as a species. So that was one thing that impacted me tremendously, uh, meeting Gopi Krishna. And the second thing is over the years, as I was privately researching all these STEs to try and understand what's happening to me, more and more patients came to my office, to my medical practice, and in confidence were telling me the stories of the diverse types of spiritual experiences, whether they were mystical experiences, kundalini awakenings, psychic phenomenon, including past life recall. So I was becoming more and more aware that many, many very healthy, mentally sound people are having these experiences that were not understood by Western medicine. And I was horrified at the stories that I heard that so many STE experiencers were being called crazy. They were being told they were hallucinating or even by their churches being told their symptoms were work of the devil. So all of this culminated, took me about 10 years, but in 1990, I came out of the closet. I had a very strong calling mystical experience when I was at a conference on Kundalini uh, put on by the Spiritual Emergence Network at ITP in Asilomar, California. I was invited there by Dr. Bronnie Greenwell, who I believe is here attending today. And this changed the course of my life. I knew with this calling experience that I had to come out of the closet. 
I had to now start advocating for people who are having these experiences to the medical profession and to the public to say they are not crazy. Kundalini, near-death experiences, and other STEs are real. At that same meeting, in fact, I believe it was at Dr. Bonnie Greenwell's house, I met Kenneth Ring, the uh, co-founder of the International Association for Near-Death Experiences. And I spoke to him about my plane crash experience. And, and, uh, and uh, for me, I, I was young and he was quite much older. I very sort of boldly and courageously said to, to him, I disagree that you have to be clinically dead to have a near-death experience. I think you can have one if you're facing death too. And uh, Ken Ring just laughed and chuckled. He said, yes, Yvonne, I've come to the same conclusion. So he confirmed for me that what happened to me in the plane crash was a near-death experience. I became a co-founder that weekend of the Kundalini Research Network. And I publicly specialized my medical practice in the counseling and research of persons with spiritually transformative experiences. So how I got into this was through my personal experiences. Now, as a medical doctor, I think an accurate diagnosis, an accurate label is really, really important for STEs. And here's a cartoon making this point in a humorous way. You can see a fellow levitating so one woman looking at him says, oh, is, is this an advanced state of cosmic consciousness? And the other woman says, no, he drank some melatonin washed down with kumboka tea. So, you know, we, we, I found it in, very important for me as a physician to accurately label paranormal experiences. So let's talk now a little bit about Kundalini or the spiritual energy awakening. So what have I learned about Kundalini in the last 40 years? Lots, but I'm gonna give you a little sense of this synthesis today um, and relate it to how I think it relates to near-death experiences and NDE symptoms. Um, so Kundalini is the Sanskrit word for a spiritual energy. And if you look in the mystical traditions of the various religions, you will find that there's always some reference to a spiritual energy, but it's given a different name. Like in some traditions, it might be called the Holy Spirit or the Holy Wind. In Buddhism, maybe it's called the Dumo Fire. Uh, but in Sanskrit, it's called the Kundalini awakening or spiritual energy awakening. And what are the classical symptoms for a Kundalini awakening? There are three. One is that there's a physical sensation of energy movement. And classically, this energy movement is up the spine and or body. And um, this is associated with inner sounds. And the inner sounds can be varying. Some people describe it as the roar of the waterfall. Some people describe it as a rushing of wings. Some people cough, describe it like the blowing of wind. Um, some people hear more a ringing. Other people have described it as like an ohm sound, ohm. Uh, but there is this energy movement up the body and, so uh, and uh, spine, typically with a, a roaring, some sort of an inner sound and often associated with light perception. Sometimes people actually have a perception of the light actually, light actually moving up their spine and body or a liquid light trickling up their spine or an explosion of light at the top of their head or as if they become luminous with light or they're surrounded with light. So there's often light perceptions associated with it. And I just wanna mention here that sometimes, although not always, it is also accompanied, the, the Kundalini waking may be accompanied by sexual sensations. So some men have described where they have a, a, an erection when there's been no sexual stimulation when the Kundalini energy uh, awakens. And women might also describe sort of a, um, a unusual sexual sensations. Now, after the Kundalini spiritual energy awakens, uh, particularly a dramatic awakening, uh, it may culminate in a mystical experience, a profound psychic experience of some sort, or a profound inspired creative experience. 
Now this is people who are having sort of a full blown Kundalini awakening where the energy goes all the way to the crown of the head. I just want to mention here that there are, are people who sometimes have partial awakenings where it, the energy does not go all the way to the head and they may have uh, less dramatic symptoms. But now I'm talking about when it goes all the way to the crown. Um, and once awakened, once the Kundalini mechanism is awakened, it remains active to some degree. So it really is an awakening. It's a beginning. And people who've had an awakening of this will have recurrent experiences of rushes of energy up the spine and body, a recurrent inner sounds, recurrent light perceptions, and recurrent STEs. So a kundalini awakening, according to yogic theory, starts a long term process of spiritual transformation of consciousness. And um, in yoga, and, and Gopi Krishna talked about this, and actually Paramahansa Yogananda talks about this too, that it actually speeds up human evolution. It speeds up our evolution of consciousness. So Inherent in this is the understanding that we are still evolving as a species. Human beings are evolving. And our next step in evolution is not that we're going to grow another arm or we're going to grow a tail or, you know, our legs are going to get longer or something like that. But rather, our range of consciousness is expanding. That is what is happening with the evolution of the human species. And that over thousands and thousands of years, more and more people are going to have an expanded range of consciousness, which will include diverse types of STEs. So people who have a Kundalini awakening, people are having STEs, that these are harbingers. These are people who are having um, sort of the, the beginnings of what is going to be happening to more and more of the human race. And the long-term goal of human evolution of consciousness and the long-term goal of the spiritual transformation of consciousness that is being accelerated by the kundalini awakening is a unitive state of consciousness which is also known as cosmic consciousness or christ consciousness or nirvana in the various traditions now this is a long-term goal and uh, we don't have time today to talk about what's involved before we reach this goal, but it is not once you have the awakening, you've reached the end result. No, it's the beginning. It's the start. Notice my first slide there. It's the start of a long-term process of spiritual transformation of consciousness with the ultimate long-term goal, maybe after several lifetimes of an ongoing unitive state of consciousness. Now, what are some of the physical symptoms or after effects that people have after they've had a kundalini awakening? And I describe all of this in my book for people who want to um, read more about it. One of these, the physical symptoms is that people have energy flows and kriyas. And kriyas are like spontaneous um, body movements related to the energy flows. And I describe this happens between the episodes of the you know acute kundalini awakening it's like their whole body is more energized and so they're feeling energy flows happening arms legs chakras um, undiagnosable body pains that that often people uh, would come into my office and they say you know doctor i'm having these weird pains and i'm having them right here and i'm having them right here and they would be pointing where their third eye chakra is and where their heart chakra is and according to yogic theory that that some of these um, unusual body pains are due to the that the activation of the inner energies or the prana which is trying to flow through the body and purify and it's hitting blockages or impurities and that is why they're getting pains in these particular points, the chakra points. Other times the, the pains and chakra points can also be related to uh, the increased intuitiveness of a person in a Kundalini process, that they're actually feeling clairsentience when they're picking up on people's emotional states and physical states, and then they also feel it in their chakra points. Uh, Kundalini, uh, people with an active Kundalini notice 
frequent metabolic changes and increased sensitivities, that they may develop new food sensitivities. They may uh, find that they have a, a decreased desire to eat meats. Other people may find they have an increased desire to eat proteins. They might have a need to eat small meals more frequently. Um, so metabolic changes can have, it seems like the whole uh, metabolism has been changed. And then there are the increased sensitivities. Those with a Kundalini awakening notice that they get much more sensitive in many areas, most commonly um, a sensitivity to sense, sensitivity to light and lights, uh, sensitivity to sounds, cannot tolerate um, certain sounds, loud noises, um, that another one, sensitivity to electromagnetic fields or this phenomenon called electromagnetic sensitivity, where the experiencer uh, actually, they get discomfort from electromagnetic fields around them. And then another part of electromagnetic sensitivity is their own energy field tends to disrupt electromagnetic fields around them so that they tend to make microphones malfunction or um, pop light bulbs or make the, 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 the alarm go off when you go through the airport, the metal detector, you set the alarm off and, and uh, things like this. Uh, your electromagnetic field uh, is somehow affecting equipment. Changes in sleep patterns. Um, people after Kundalini awakening sometimes will notice that they have a, a dramatic decrease in their need for sleep you know, that they're sleeping much less um, than they used to. And then that might go for a period of time. And then all of a sudden they find that they're requiring more sleep uh, than they used to. Um, and then there's another phenomenon, which is very common in those with an active Kundalini, which is the middle of the night wakening, where suddenly they find themselves awake, usually between two, three in the morning, uh, for no explicable reason that they're wide awake in the middle of the night. And when I've gone around over the years and spoken to audiences about this, and I would say, let's have a show of hands here. How many of you have uh, problems with middle of the night waking? We can still do it here. We won't see each other's hands. How many of you have that? Just put your hands up. We'll just see how many put their hands up. Well, quite a few putting your hands up already, that middle of the night awakening. Another thing that uh, people with an active Kundalini will have is all sorts of light perceptions, where it can be everything from, um, you know, being able to see patterns of light around people, like being able to perceive uh, living beings, or it's not just people, around plants, around rocks, around all objects, being able to see light patterns. Um, other people will describe times where they're actually, it's like they can see air, you know, that they see little speckles of light around them, that like, seeing air, um, times where objects may seem luminous, times where they themselves may feel that they are luminous. Um, so all sorts of interesting light perceptions. Um, inner sounds, as I mentioned, uh, some of the inner sounds earlier on, variations of them, chirping crickets, um, gong sounds, um, the ohm sound, a buzzing of bees, um, the, uh, the, the rumble like a motor, um, the, the celestial wind chimes, inner ringing, all sorts of inner sounds, um, sexual energy changes, um, times that uh, the kundalini person with active kundalini may go through periods where inexplicably their sexual energy is dramatically decreased um and it just it seems like all their sexual energy is needed for their internal process and they don't have energy for um the outer procreative act and then there are other times that people with a kundalini awakening find their sexual energy dramatically increased um, as if their, their body is producing more sexual energy than, than uh, they can use for their inner processes, which leads to a very strong sex drive. So uh, it's important to realize these are normal changes that can happen in a person with a kundalini awakening. And the final category of experience I call loosely yogic phenomenon. And yogic phenomenon is when people with a kundalini awakening will all of a sudden find themselves spontaneously going into yogic postures, even if they don't know yoga. Uh, spontaneously doing hand movements that uh, later on they found out these are mu mudras or, or, or sacred hand movements from the yogic tradition. So these are some of the physical after effects that people will notice after kundalini awakening. Now as I'm going through these, some of you might be NDEers in the audience and you might think, huh, a lot of these symptoms 
are symptoms that I had after my near-death experience. And a lot of these symptoms are NDE after effect symptoms. That's my point exactly. There are a lot of similarities in the after effects of a Kundalini awakening and the after effects of a white light type of near death experience. Now let's go on to some of the other after effects of a Kundalini awakening. Psychological after effects are very powerful after Kundalini awakening. That, that purification is one of the powerful types of psychological after effects is that the individual feels drawn. They want to do their recovery work. They want to embrace their healing and recovery work to purify whatever issues need to be healed in their heart and in their psyche. And so people often then will, you know, get into recovery. They will get into psychotherapy. Um, that, that they will be consciously trying to uh, do their self-improvement work. They have a strong impulse to do this after a kundalini awakening. The other thing that happens though is purgation. And what purgation is, is that it's a spontaneous process happening in the person, in the experiencer, where they find themselves spontaneously having repressed memories or repressed wounds come up into their consciousness and it's like an inner house cleaning is happening that the energies are loosening up shadow issues that need to be healed and bring them up into the person's consciousness forcing them to have to deal with it and this can sometimes be distressing to a kundalini uh, experiencer because uh, they're not aware that this is a normal part of the process that the, the spiritual energy seems to bring issues up that saying to the psyche, it's time for these to be healed now. Spiritually after effects, after a Kundalini awakening, marked increased spiritual focus, increased spiritual searching, increased desire to spend time in the spiritual life, doing prayer, meditating, spiritual study, going on spiritual retreats, being in nature to be alone with God and with oneself. And then spiritually, there's also an opening of the heart that happens progressively and continually after a Kundalini awakening, after a healthy Kundalini awakening, where the heart is opening to give and receive more love, to express more forgiveness. And then as we get deeper and longer into the spiritual path, moving into deeper states of service to others, you know, unselfishness and moving on to surrender, surrender to be instruments of the divine will. So these are stages of the opening of the heart spiritually. And then the last after effect of the Kundalini awakening is paranormal, that people who've had a Kundalini awakening start having all kinds of STEs, all the different types start being a normal part of their life. Now, what is the yogic model of our body and soul? We need to look at this before we can look at the near-death experience from the yogic model. Well, according to the yogic model, we are immortal souls. And our soul is encased in our body. But our souls reincarnate lifetime after lifetime in new bodies in order to learn and grow until we finally are all gonna eventually make it back home to that unit of state of consciousness or God consciousness. So this is the work of many, 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 many lifetimes. So the soul, when we are embodied in a physical incarnation, according to the yogic model, we are encased in three bodies, each one being uh, denser than the other. So that the very first layer or body that we are encased in, in yoga, is called the causal body. And the causal body is consisting of pure consciousness, pure intelligence. So that we are, our soul is encased in a causal body of pure consciousness, pure intelligence. 
And then the causal body is encased, although they all interpenetrate, in a denser body, which is the energy body or the astral body. And the astral body is made up of prana, that's the word from yoga, or what in English we would call life energy and light. So that is the astral body. So when people are observing auras, they are observing the astral body, which is the energy body, which is um, superimposed on the causal body and the soul. And then the, la the last, the third encasement, the most dense encasement is the physical body and which we all have. So that they're, they're actually, you know, we can't say one layer over the other because they're interpenetrating, but they're a matter of denseness. The densest body is the physical body. So what happens at birth? Uh, and this is as described by Paramahansa Yogananda, the great yogi, father of yoga in the West. So part, according to Paramahansa Yogananda, the soul, which is encased in the astral body and causal body, enters the embryo at the time of conception. And then when the um, brain and spinal cord start developing in the fetus, that the soul descends from the brain down the spinal cord and the prana flows out from the astral spine into the body. So it's actually the prana of the astral body that's encompassing the soul that gives life to the physical body. And it's the causal body that has the intelligence that's actually guiding the body's development and functions. So it's not actually the genes you know, everyone thinks the genes and the DNA are doing it. They're doing a part, but it's actually the causal body intelligence that guides the body's development, according to yogic theory. And what happens in, during a kundalini awakening, according to yogic theory? So during a kundalini awakening, supposedly this prana life energy, which is normally flowing out from the spine, giving life and direction to all of our body organs. And also ojas, which is sublimated sexual energy from our sexual regions, reverses direction of flow. So instead of flowing outwards, which is the normal direction, it starts flowing inwards to the spine and upwards. It flows up the central channel in the astral spine, which is called the sushumna in yoga. And when this prana and ojas, so these are the sensations that people feel with energy flowing upwards and inwards up the spine. And when this ojas and prana reaches the brain, according to yogic theory, that it stimulates uh, or awakens a region or function in the brain, sort of like opening doors the spiritual eye is opened, and this enables one to perceive what we call STEs, this paranormal expanded range of consciousness, that this is the mechanism, according to yoga, that is happening with the kundalini awakening. And what are some of the stimulants to kundalini awakening? The most powerful one um, I have found in my research is meditation. And this is why in various yogic traditions, it is always recommended if you want to speed your spiritual growth, if you want to speed your evolution of consciousness, meditation is the key. Also the blessing or Shakti put from a highly realized saint is also a powerful stimulus to awaken the spiritual energy mechanism. Pranayama, which are um, breath control techniques in meditation to help awaken the kundalini, powerful stimulant. Near-death experiences, in my opinion, white light near-death experiences are also a stimulant to kundalini awakening. And less commonly from the research that I've done over the years, uh, intense devotion and prayer, concentration on the spiritual subject, falling in love, 
and very rarely sex can be stimulants to kundalini awakening. So what happens after the kundalini, the initial kundalini awakening, what happens afterwards? Well, that this astral shashumna channel, this channel that the energy flowed up the spine remains open. It doesn't close completely. And that if one meditates, that it stimulates continued kundalini activity. It's creating a magnetism, particularly when you meditate with your focus here on the third eye center. It's creating a magnetism, which is drawing the kundalini energy to continue to function, to bring the energy up to the brain. And people have, dependent on how much their kundalini remains active, recurrent symptoms, recurrent STEs, recurrent mystical experiences, out-of-body experiences, psychic phenomenon, revelations, inspired creativity. They may all occur. Now, what? let's move on now to near-death experiences and see how we can connect this. So what is a near-death experience? Well, a near-death experience is an out-of-body or white light mystical experience that occurs when a person is clinically dead, close to death, or when psychologically facing imminent death or trauma. Now, every brush with death is not a near-death experience. <laughs> this, this is my numerous, humorous way of making this point, that not every brush with death is a near-death experience. Sometimes it's just a brush with the death that in order for it, it is not a near-death experience if you have a brush with death and you do not have any sort of out-of-body or mystical experience. It's not a near-death experience. It's simply a brush with death. And similarly, if you have an NDE-like experience, so symptoms that are very similar to an NDE, but it does not happen when you're close to death or facing trauma, it is not a near-death experience. It is what it is. It's a mystical experience or it's an out-of-body experience. So you have to have both for it to be called a near-death experience. And the features Raymond Moody described these, I'm going to go through them very quickly. Ineffable, uh, an experience that is a felt experience that is beyond words. There's auditory awareness of what's going on around the dead or unconscious body. Strong feelings of peace that come over the individual unusual inner sounds, the sensation of going out of body, sometimes traveling through a dark space or tunnel. We may, may meet spirits, beings of light on the other side, may enter the white light realm or the mystical realm. There may or may not be a life review. There may be a life barrier or a choice before coming back to the body. The return to the body is generally abrupt Afterwards, the person has conviction of the reality of the experience. They know they didn't uh, imagine it. And then the memory of the experience is ingrained in their memory. They can remember it for the rest of their life. Has a transformational impact on the individual. They have new views of death, meaning specifically that they lose their fear of death. And then there's independent corroboration of things that they observed while they were out of body. So these are the, the classic features of near-death experiences. Now, what about a connection between near-death experiences and Kundalini? Who has observed this? Well, we've had three principal authors who uh, I'm mentioning here, there may be more, who have written that they postulated that there's a possible relationship between near-death experiences and kundalini. And one is Dr. Kenneth Ring, co-founder of IANS. A second one is Dr. Bruce Grayson, another co-founder of IANS. And the third one is myself. I've been writing about this in my book since 1994. Now, both Ken Ring and Bruce Grayson did studies using kundalini rating scales on people who'd had near-death experiences. And they found that near-death experiencers score higher on kundalini rating scales than people who've not had a near-death experience, which would tend to support that people having particularly the white light near-death experience are activating their kundalini during the NDE. Now, another person who's been writing 
saying that they thought NDEs and Kundalini awakening were connected was Gopi Krishna, who I told you I met in India in the 70s and who was a mentor to me. Gopi Krishna explicitly wrote that he thought that the Kundalini could awaken during a near-death experience. And he postulated that one of the reasons the Kundalini might awaken is to protect the brain. Because with the upward flow of the prana and the ojas, this is potent life force protecting the brain. So he said, when you, the brain is hypoxic, you know, when the heart's not functioning, that maybe the Kundalini awakens. It's like a body's self-protective mechanism to try and give the, 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 the pure nutrients to the brain to keep the brain alive. That was one thing he speculated. He talked about an ancient, uh, it's sort of a, a not well-known technique in yoga called the Ketri Mudra. And the Ketri Mudra, he thinks, was to, this is supposed to awaken the Kundalini. And what this mudra is, people would learn to turn their tongue back, and they would even cut that little thing underneath the tongue, the frenulum, to be able to turn their tongue back further and further and further until they could basically block their airway with their own tongue. And he said that he thought the origin of this was that in ancient days, the adepts realized that if you asphyxiated, that the Kundalini would sometimes awaken to protect the brain. And so that people were doing this to try and awaken the Kundalini energy. Another example that Gopi Krishna gave was ancient Egypt. And there evidently are rituals that have been written about when someone was going to be a prospective pharaoh, where they would take this individual and they would lock them in a tomb in one of the, the center of one of the pyramids in a ritual. And of course, without air in a closed tomb, someone will asphyxiate unless the Kundalini would awaken and that this energy would protect the brain. And so when they opened the, 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 the tomb after 24 or 48 hours, however long they locked the person out, and if they were still alive, it was assumed that they had awakened the Kundalini and they could become the prophet, uh, the, the, uh, the Pharaoh. And in Egypt, they often have these headdresses with a serpent coming out of the third eye, which is sort of a universal symbol for the Kundalini. So um, Gopi Krishna thought this was also known in ancient Egypt, this connection between near-death experiences and awakening the Kundalini. Now, what happens at the moment of death in the yogic model? And this was explained by Paramahansa Yogananda. So, at the moment of death, as, as Yogananda says, and many yogis describe it, but I'm using the, the way that Yogananda described it. At the moment of death, when it comes our time of death, that our soul, which is encapsulated in our astral body and our causal body, leaves our physical body. So it withdraws. So it's sort of the reverse of what happens when we're born, withdraws from the physical body into the spine, that there's sort of a knot at the base of the spine that gets untied and the soul and astral body rises up the astral spine and exits the body through the top of the head. And then the soul encased in its astral and causal body goes into the astral planes between incarnations till its next incarnation. So what would be the yogic interpretation of a near death experience then? Well, from the yogic model, while a person is close to death, or if they're clinically dead, the soul that is encased in its astral body and its causal body withdraws from the physical body and starts going up the spine to leave. And the kundalini might awaken when this happens to help the soul leave, that maybe that's a natural thing, that the kundalini awakens to help sort of push the soul up, out where you belonged into the astral planes, or as Gopi Krishna said, maybe it awakens to protect the brain. So the last uh, effort to protect the brain until it's absolutely certain that um, 
the person will not live on. And uh, this is interesting because they've now discovered, I'm just making an aside here, that they've done studies to see how long after somebody is clinically dead can we still resuscitate them. And they're discovering it's quite a while. It's quite a while that you can resuscitate people. So has the Kundalini awakened? Is it protecting the brain when the person is clinically dead? Interesting theory. And the other thing I want to say about yogic understanding of death and no near and NDEs is that Yogananda talks about that some souls go to the astral heavens or other places in the astral planes and other souls go very briefly into the astral heavens, but then they enter what he calls the great sleep between incarnations. And so people who enter the great sleep between incarnations wouldn't remember anything happening. It's like being in a deep sleep. So uh, that helps me understand uh, why some people who've been dead and resuscitated remember nothing happening, whereas other people do remember going into um, the astral planes. Now, according to yoga, we have these astral centers along the spine called the chakras. And this is a little map of the chakras here. And we understand in the yogic model that there are certain symptoms and certain sounds and certain phenomenon associated with each of the chakras. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at the progressive symptoms of a near-death experience and how they correspond to progressively rising up the chakras from the root chakra as our consciousness starts at the root and then rises up the spine and exits in the crown. So NDE symptoms, one of the first couple of symptoms that happens in NDEs is often this feeling of peace and they no longer feel fear. They no longer feel pain. And this is what happens when you rise out of the root chakra, which is the chakra where fear is felt. When you rise up to the second chakra or above, that you do not feel fear. Similarly, another very early symptom in near-death experiences is hearing what was said, accurately hearing what was said around your dead or unconscious body. And this is again a second chakra phenomenon that you can clear audiently hear what is around you. Out-of-body experience comes next. Now, out-of-body experiences can come at various chakras, can come at the second chakra, the third chakra, the heart chakra, the third chakra, and the crown. So we can go out into different uh, levels in the astral planes. Uh, I've talked sometimes the astral planes, there are many levels in the astral planes, upper, uh, lighter, more light filled levels, more medium ones that are sort of like ours and lower dark filled ones. So there are many chakras we can go out of body as the energy is rising up the body. The roaring sound that people describe the inner sounds of a near-death experience. And like I told you, I heard this roar, like the roar of a waterfall in my NDE. This is described in yoga of the, well, they describe it as the ohm sound, this rushing sound, like the roaring of the ocean. The sound of the, the consciousness rising up the astral sound, the astral spine, that this is supposedly the, sound, the inner sound just as it is with a kundalini awakening, you get that inner roaring sound. That's the sound made as the consciousness is rising up the astral spine. Then we have the dark space or tunnel. And the dark space or tunnel, according to um, yogic tradition, um, is some people say it's the perception of rising up the spine. Paramahansa Yogananda says it's the perception of moving out through the third eye that moving out through the third eye, one often perceives like a tunnel until we get actually to the white light realm. So this would be a sixth chakra uh, uh, experience according to Paramahansa Yogananda. Then when we start seeing beings of light, that is also a sixth chakra experience. But when we get into the white light realm, that would then be moving us into a crown or seventh chakra mystical experience. So it's interesting to see that the progression of symptoms in a near-death experience can be correlated with the possible 
rising of the astral body up through the chakra systems, possibly with the Kundalini awakening. And interesting that the after effects of near death experiences are very, very similar to the after effects of somebody who's had a Kundalini awakening. Many, many NDEers report having these after effects, the inner sounds, the light perceptions, the rushes of energy, their body up the spine, new sensitivities, metabolic and sleep changes, including middle of the night awakening, developing new psychic abilities and recurrent STEs. All of these are Kundalini after effects. All of these are also NDE after effects. So in conclusion, I want to say that there is strong evidence that a kundalini awakening can sometimes occur during a near-death experience. And I personally think we need a, not, a lot more research to try and understand more about how near-death experiences, kundalini awakenings, and other spiritually transformative experiences are connected. So if you want to read more, that is my book. And we also write about much of this on our Spiritual Awakenings website. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and I would be very happy to answer any questions. All right. I'm going to give the others some time to write in any questions they have, but to get it started. As you were talking, I was asking myself, why are these happening? You know, about when, and how, what they experience. But I found myself reflecting on a book written by Kenneth Ring, Lessons from the Light, or Heading for Omega, and he gave a definition of Omega. So my question is, what is your perspective of how Kundalini awakenings help us achieve the Omega point? This is the definition that Ken shared with us from Pierre Tillehard in his book, The Phenomenon of Man. The Omega Point, the birth of a unified planetary mind, aware of its essential divinity, the culmination of human evolution on Earth. So again, that question is, what is your perspective of how kundalini awakenings help us achieve the omega point. Okay. Um, I just want to point out to people before I answer that question, if you have a question, just press the chat link at the bottom of the page and write your question in there and then you hit return and your question will be, uh, make it into the chat uh, lineup. Um, so it's Pierre, Pierre Desjardins is the one that he, uh, Teilhard Desjardins is, is who he was talking about. Um, and um, basically, I, I, I covered this a little bit in um, what I was talking about. According to yogic theory, that we are all evolving. We are all growing and learning incarnation after incarnation after incarnation. And that um, the slow but steady route is incarnation after incarnation after incarnation. That um, Yogananda calls it the bullock cart route. You know, that's a cart driven by a, a, an ox. <laughs> that, that everybody, whether we're trying or not, in God's plan, that we're slowly inching our way forwards in our soul growth, in our soul evolution. Okay. But there are faster ways to travel. <laughs> <laughs> there are faster ways to travel than bullet cars. You know that there are cars and now there are trains and then there are planes and now we have rockets. And um, so Yogananda used to say that meditation and particularly Kundalini activation and meditation is the airplane route. That's the fi fastest route to promote your soul's transformation to make it to your ultimate end point, which is everybody's end point after many, many incarnations, is the state of uh, what, what he, uh, Teilhard de Chardin called it Omega and Ken Ring was calling it that as well. Um, but that in other traditions, it's called God consciousness. 
cosmic consciousness, unit of consciousness. So this is a state of consciousness that, that you know, from our various traditions that Christ, that Buddha, that some of these greats were in, that they were in a unitive state of consciousness where all the time, it's not that they were having episodic STEs, all of the time that they are is stabilized in this expanded state of consciousness where they're experiencing their oneness with the infinite source, their intuitive channels are wide open and that their hearts are so clear and so purified that they can be perfectly clear instruments of the divine will on the planet. And that over many, many, many incarnations is the goal for all of us. And I think those of us having STEs, whether it be a Kundalini awakening, whether it be near death experience, whether it's intuitive awakenings, it's that we're being given a prod by spirit saying, ha ha, there's a faster way to find your way home. Guess what? The reason you're here is to try and learn and grow and find your way home. It's like a teaser, like a carrot on the end of a stick saying, you know, now I've given you a glimpse. So why don't you work towards it? And so how we work towards it is by doing our inner healing and recovery work, by living a, uh, a life based on spiritual principles and by embracing our spiritual uh, life, you know, with prayer, meditation, spiritual study. That's great. That's good insight. All right, so we do have four questions. First one's from Althea. And she states, during my OBE, I went to a place I will call paradise. And I had answers to everything at once. Is that common? Thank you for the question, Althea. So I would say, uh, I cannot tell you how common or uncommon that is because I don't think there's enough research uh, to say what is most common, what is less common. But I can certainly say other people have experienced it and um, I have experienced it. I experienced it during my last near-death experience when I was on the other side. Um, I experienced it after my 1995 experience, near-death experience, when I was in a unit of state for two months. And in that state, I any information I needed was just automatically there. And so I think you were given a glimpse, glimpse Althea, of the unit of state or omega or cosmic consciousness that we were talking about. And I would take that as an invitation, a carrot that was being given you, to you by the higher power saying, Yes, this is possible for you. Uh, keep working. And uh, yes, this is possible for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, from Addison. What specific meditation techniques may increase the probability of achieving a Kundalini awakening? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, over the years, I have tried many different meditation techniques. I mean, I've been meditating for 45 years now. And um, I, different people have different temperaments and different personalities. So based on your temperament and personality, you might be attracted to a different type of meditation technique or a different type of spiritual path. Like some people are much more devotional and much more filled with love. And so they resonate with a path and with a technique where the love of God and singing and joy is an integral part of that path and those techniques. Um, then there are other people who are perhaps more intellectual and analytical by temperament. And so that they resonate more with a path or with a technique that's more sort of um, analytical and contemplative involving thinking about the nature of God, the nature of reality. So I guess what I'm trying to say, there isn't a one size fits all. Um, so I think in, in a certain way, you need to follow the way your heart is guiding you. But that being said, I think that um, you should embrace the spiritual path that resonates with your heart 
and everybody goes through stages where they're exploring and that's normal you know you have to go through that so good explore try this out try that out try this out try that out until you find a path and a technique that resonates with your heart so when you do find a path or a technique that resonates with your heart then what i'd say is commit to that path you know stop sampling from a whole bunch of different wells and and drink deeply from the well that is nourishing you that resonates with your heart and soul so and following the spiritual guidelines of this path you know in terms of living a righteous life do not lie do not steal uh you know be kind and loving to one another that's pretty well universal in all all, all true religions but embracing your inner psychological healing and recovery work this is also essential i mean these are both of these things are essential to have a healthy kundalini awakening and then the third step on top of that is meditation and so meditation techniques i would say to begin with i would start with sort of a, a stillness technique or a vipassana technique where you're observing the breath. That's a very good way to start. Um, other mindfulness technique might be a good way to start. Um, if your particular spiritual path has uh, teaches meditation, like Christian meditation or Jewish meditation or meditation in Islam, take that course and 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 start meditating congruent with the spiritual path that 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 you feel called to follow. And then if you want to uh, uh, increase the likelihood of a kundalini awakening that is doing all of what i've already said follow when picking a path and embracing the the getting your life together following the spiritual principles doing your inner work regular meditation practice then the next step would be lengthening your meditation practice so starting with you know 15 20 minutes twice a day working up to an hour twice a day regularly and then at least once a week doing a longer meditation for two hours or for three hours and then maybe going away on meditation retreats where you can spend five hours a day in meditation now you're asking me seriously you're wanting to grow deeper and awaken the kundalini so these are the types of steps we could take now in various paths um, i happen to follow the self-realization fellowship path and there are more advanced meditation techniques uh, in those paths that will help to awaken kundalini awakening but that is under supervision so i i recommend um, not that to get into a path with a teacher who or um, a lineage that you can talk with people uh, in case you do awaken the kundalini so that you can get some comfort and reassurance um, when you start having some of these unusual symptoms. That being said, if you've already awakened the kundalini and you're not under one of these paths that um, reading things like my book, what's on the website, consulting with people like Dr. Bonnie Greenwell or Emma Bragdon who are quite expert in counseling people who've had kundalini awakenings would be a, a way to ground yourself if you've awakened and you're not uh, in the safety of a lineage that cannot guide you. It's a pretty thorough review. I'm just going to apply it a little bit to myself because I'm exploring this regiment of meditation and the hardest part for me is breaking my routine to start a new one. You know, setting that time aside and actually using that time to go through a process um, with some of the techniques you talked about. So it's it's a challenge because there's so many different options to try, um, but selecting one and putting myself, disciplining myself to actually do it is the challenge. But uh, all right, so we're going to go to Clara's question. Please, could you describe again Prius? Okay. Well, in Kriya is a Sanskrit word and um, it has two meanings. And the, the meaning that I was using when I was describing Kriyas is um, movement. I mean, Kriya basically means movement in Sanskrit. 
So it's spontaneous movements that people will start going into when they're having a Kundalini awakening. And I have seen um, over the years, many types of movements that people can go into after Kundalini awakening. Sometimes they will start jerking with pulsing with the energy that I described to you where sometimes I'd be meditating and I literally be jerking back and forth with the pulses of the energy going up my spine. Other times movements, people will sort of shudder, you know, that with, with the energy going up their spine, there's like a, a movement, a shuddering sensation. Um, other movements, sometimes people will, will tell me that they, they just feel drawn to move into a particular posture, you know, that they've got to touch their legs or they've got to stretch their chest open or they've got to twist their spine, that they feel that intuitively that they're being called to make some sort of movement. And then other times, that their body just moves into these postures, even then they're not trying to do it, that just moves into a yoga posture. So um, sometimes spinning, people have said that all of a sudden they started spinning. Uh, I've, I've read, although I've not had anyone tell me directly that sometimes they started hopping, that, that various phenomena related to energy moving in the body that is actually physically making the body move. So that was the sense I was using the word kriyas when I was describing that as a, a physical after effect symptom that some people get with a kundalini awakening. Okay. Eve has a question. Why do some souls go into deep sleep? Well, I can answer that question very simply, Eve. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and that would be the honest answer. Just don't know. I mean, there are many mysteries in God's creation. Um, I'm constantly being humbled by the fact that having been researching STEs for 40 years, I'm continually learning more. You know, and I'm reminded of that saying in the Bible, I believe it was Jesus who said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And um, it is so true. I mean, God's creation is so vast and there's so many mysteries. We're just beginning to understand a little bit, a little bit of God's infinite universe. So why some people go into the great sleep and other people go into astral heavens, I will say God knows why and um, I do not. Okay. Yeah, I've had that question before. Uh, Althea is continuing on. She says, my kundalini experience healed me from getting an illness every three months. So kundalini, which is connected to our chakra system, is also a healing mechanism. Do you feel the same? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, Althea. And that connects to what uh, Gopi Krishna said, that he thought the kundalini awakens when someone is being asphyxiated because it's trying to protect the brain. So that's that nourishing, that's that healing potential of capacity of the kundalini. Um, I also want to share, share here, I didn't tell the story today, uh, just because of time limitations, about my brain healing experience in 2016. As some of you know, because you've heard my other talks, is I was injured with a very serious traumatic brain injury in November of 2003. And I was disabled for 12 years uh, due to um, the, the resultant after effects of this traumatic brain injury. And on February the 24th, 2016, when I was deeply meditating in a meditation retreat in Encinitas, California, the Self-Realization Fellowship Meditation Retreat, in a spot where Yogananda used to meditate and go into samadhi, <laughs> I, I find myself very sensitive to holy places and go very deep into my meditations in the vibration of holy places. I suddenly inwardly experienced like a volcano of light erupting in the center of my brain. And I could see it clearly inwardly, like a liquid light, a volcano of liquid light erupting in the center of my brain. And the, the sensation, the subjective sensation I had was of waking up as if 
the center of my brain had been asleep for 12 years and suddenly woke up, like literally the lights came on um, with this eruption of liquid light in the center of my brain. And I have always wondered if that liquid light was the Kundalini. And um, I think quite possibly it was because I've been in Kundalini process just for some degree since 1976. And um, so through the grace of God, <laughs> the healing power of meditation and the healing power of the Kundalini perhaps all came together. So yes, thank you for saying that. Was that Althea? Yeah, yeah. Gop Gopi Krishna talked about um, Kundalini energy being the most powerful healing nutritive tonic that the body has. I love the way you shared that with your own experience, your own awakening. And I remember that now when you told how you had that brain healing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, our next one is, uh, excuse me if I mess this name up, Quinnon is asking, if in this life we move forward on a faster route, but don't reach the final goal, will we incorporate this growth in our next reincarnation? According to yogic theory, yes. So that the, the soul learning that we achieve in this particular incarnation carries with us into our next incarnation. So that is hopeful. And, um, you know, if you've had a kundalini awakening or not, it's sort of like going through school, you know, that it, once you graduate grade 10 math, you don't have to repeat grade 10 math. You can move on to grade 11 math and higher. So that that go, goes on with your soul from incarnation to incarnation. And that's something I wanted to share was that um, uh, in my last near death experience, which was in 2003, when I had my head injury that I told you about, uh, when I was on the other side, when I was dead for a period of time, I went into this realm of pure consciousness and in that realm where I could take in vast amounts of information all at once, I remembered all of my past lives and I could see how my very past lives fit together. But something that's interesting, and I just want to share this, not to discourage people, but just to share on God's plan is incredible. It was not linear. You know what I mean? Like it all fit together, but it was not linear. You know, that, 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 um, you know, maybe we go off sideways to do uh, geography in grade 10, whereas we're going off sideways in another way to do math in grade 11, and then back to do, I don't know, basic science in grade nine, so that, that it was not a linear thing between my various incarnations. And the other thing is on the other side, how I experienced it was, it was actually as if all incarnations were happening at the same time, which is really sort of inexplicable because we don't experience it this way. But on the other side, that's how it appeared. So, but according to yogic theory, yes, we definitely, you know, once we finished math, grade 10 math, that carries on with our soul. We don't have to repeat that class. Yeah, I can affirm that too. I remember in the Edgar Casey readings that he would give a past life review of somebody and at the end he would summarize the entity gained or the entity lost during this lifetime. And then he'd go to their next life, the entity gained or the entity lost. So it was progressive as he went through one person's uh, previous incarnations. It was interesting. But so it's an affirmation. Um, all right, well, Eunice says, thank you so much for a great and super informative talk. Stay well all, must bow out now. So we are coming close to the end of our question and answer period. Uh, got another from Vicki saying, thank you so, so much. Thoroughly enjoyed this session. So if you're thinking of one more question, I'll give you time to type. And while you're doing that, I'd like to share an upcoming event. We have a special day coming up in November and we call it Veterans Day. If you haven't met me before, I am a retired army officer and I'm deeply involved with the affairs of the veterans in my own community um, with, through the Disabled American Veterans. 
So we're gonna expand that. We do have our veterans, military, and first responders program here in SAI. And we are looking to expand that. And our first inaugural event will be this Veterans Day at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Our guest speaker will be Chaplain Reverend John Price. And John's been around a while. He's a pastoral counselor for um, Near-Death Experiencers Re Research Foundation, NDERF. And he's also a retired Colonel, a Texas National Guard so officer. And uh, he'll give us insight because what do you do when an experiencer is in the military? They're afraid to expose what happened to them. They're afraid of losing their benefits, promotion opportunities, being declared men mentally ill. So we wanna give a safe environment for them to share. And usually that would be through the pastoral or chaplaincy programs. And so John will be our first introduction to our Veterans Military First Responders Program and as we say on the website, we're open to hearing from more experiencers in these fields because they need a safe place they can share. And if you know somebody that's had an experience and might be willing to share, please contact us. But I'm not, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. So I, on behalf of everybody, Yvonne, I'd like to say thank you. It's nice to see the charts with the bullets, which helps me keep your thoughts and organized. Because this is new material for me. Just because I'm on the board doesn't mean I know this stuff. <laughs> so on behalf of everybody, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President, Robert. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Dr. Kason, for a great presentation. I learned a lot today. <laughs> And uh, also want to thank Chicago Ions for co-sponsoring uh, the event today. It was it was wonderful on 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 their behalf. Thank you once again. Uh, as a reminder, Linda did bring up about the special Veterans Day presentation. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be exciting. Uh, also, as a reminder. Our monthly October presentation, and every month, it's the third Saturday of the month, and it's free. But in October, it's Dr. Nicole Gruel from Australia. I guess that's going to be co-sponsored by Sydney Ions. And then in November, we have Raymond O'Brien from, uh, from England, from, from the United Kingdom. And December, Dr. Christopher Kerr. And they're all wonderful presentations. And I think that pretty much is it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kason. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being part of SAI. Please tell everyone about us. We would love to have them subscribe. We would love to have a reach out into more countries and it's just been a great experience. Yvonne, go ahead. Cheers. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to say goodbye to everyone in six languages again. So goodbye, everybody, until October 17th. So adios, buenos tardes, au revoir, avirusin, arrivederci, and ciao. <laughs> Bye, everybody.